Well, I remember my first week of college, uh, I had missed most of orientation. I had been sick with fever, so I laid in bed shivering. And so when I showed up my first day at Texas A&M, I was disoriented. Uh, It was a campus that covered hundreds of acres with thousands of students. It was overwhelming and a town I had never lived in and I felt confused and intimidated. And on top of that, as a freshman, uh, I applied to live in the freshman dorm, at least to be among others who had experienced the same things I was experiencing, but I was denied. And so I had to hurry up and find a place to live, and I lived off campus in a house with some upperclassmen uh, who weren't bad guys, but uh, really weren't interested in sort of helping me figure out how to integrate into the school. Uh, I lived in their attic. Uh, so I could stand at one part of my room, uh, but then had to progressively get lower and, uh, and roll into my bed every night. Uh, but I remember as I was trying to figure out my way in college, one of my first nights there uh, at school, I, I went, got groceries for the first time and was unpacking them in the kitchen. And, and, and a girl came out of one of the guy's rooms uh, in uh, various states of undress, uh, said, what are you doing in my kitchen? And I was like, I live here, I pay rent, I don't know. And I realized like, oh, I didn't realize... Uh, girlfriends lived here. I'm okay, acclimating to a new reality relationally here. And, and then we had a party that night. And uh, as the party was raging and going hard, I remember a guy threw me a beer and I was like, I'm 18, I don't drink. And he started laughing. And he said, uh, that'll change. And I remember I went to bed that night as I've kind of rolled into my bed and pulled up the covers. Uh, as this little Christian Sunday school kid, I realized I don't know the rules here, and I feel disoriented, and I don't know how to navigate this space. How do I move in this new context? How do I hold on to my faith in the midst of maybe a faithless environment? Not mean, but just not with the same allegiance that I have. Or should I hold on to this faith? My mom taught it to me, but is it something childish that should be left behind as I walk into a new secular age? Now, why do I bring that up? Because we're starting a series today that we're titling Believers in Babylon. Or you could say it another way, how does the Christian navigate a secular culture? And we're doing it by looking at the book of Daniel. And if you've never read it, Daniel is one of the most exciting and enigmatic books ever written in human history. This book is exciting and it's strange. And one of the reasons it's strange is because it it divides neatly into two sections that are really two different genres combined in one book. The first half of the book, the first six chapters, are the book of action. They are history as we see the believers in God surviving under pagan domination, that we're watching the nation of Israel in exile. And then the second half is prophecy, that we're going to get a vision through the corridors of history into the centuries beyond Daniel's time and up to ours, and then beyond things that haven't happened yet. And the prophecies are bizarre. We're going to see creatures with horns rise up out of the ocean with horns that speak blasphemies. And in the midst of that, there is going to be prophecies in the book of Daniel that are so exact and precise that some scholars attempt to late date Daniel. They say there's no way a man living in the fifth century BC could have known these things about human history. Humans can't know the future. If this really is prophecy, then this must be the word of God, which we would say it is. And so it's a book of prophecy, but not just uh, to show us interesting things about the future. It's to give us hope to show us how God is ruling over the nations, but then also to show us how we're meant to move among them. It's a book of apocalypse. That's what the prophecy is. The the verb apocalypto means to uncover or reveal. That's why in the New Testament, our apocalyptic book is called Revelation. Let me peel the curtain back and show you how God is leading the nations through the corridors of time, right? Uh, And really, Revelation is just a commentary on the book of Daniel that will show us all the nations as God leads them through history up until our introduction to the Antichrist and the dominion of the Ancient of Days, right? But it doesn't just show us that uh, for curiosity. It's to give us hope. And so it's not just a book of prophecy. It's a book of perspective, 
God is ruling over the nations. Now, how are we meant to move among them? It's a book of perspective and a book of practice. And the first six chapters are about the practice. As we look at these stories of Daniels and the boys surviving in Babylon, we're going to read it, and it looks like an action movie. It looks like a political thriller as you watch these boys attempting to be squeezed into the mold of the political pressure. The question that will come out before us is, will God be faithful in the midst of the fiery furnace and the lion's den? One of the biggest questions the book of Daniel, Daniel answers is, how do young believers navigate government jobs in the midst of uncertainty through changing administrations and government? So I thought it would apply to us this fall, right? <laughs> But even if you don't work in government, how do I live as a believer maybe when my boss at my job isn't interested in honoring the same God I honor? How do I keep my faith intact if I'm at a secular university? How do I survive Babylon U? And will God be faithful even when his people are faithless? The book of Daniel happens in the darkest moment of Israel's history, their exile in Babylon, and we're going to watch God show up, and we'll see the actions we're meant to do in these first six chapters. Then we'll get into the apocalypse about November. Things will get really weird. In the text, I'm not saying prophesying uh, right now over what will happen in November, but uh, as we jump into this, God is not just going to tell us what's to come. He's going to tell us how to navigate now. How does the believer move in Babylon? And we're just looking at chapter one. And chapter one is an introduction. We're going to kind of locate the boys geopolitically on the map, right? And then we're going to meet our main characters and see the pressure that's put on them to conform into an unbelieving day. And then we're going to watch the decisions they make and see the outcome. And we're going to watch these boys rise to prominent positions in the government in their day, the believers in Babylon. But in verses 1 and 2, we get the historical setting. And if you were to ask a, a, a Jew in the Old Testament, what is the worst possible thing that could happen? They would tell you three things. They would tell you defeat, degradation, and deportation. Defeat, that our Judean king would be put into the hands of a pagan ruler. Degradation, that our temple dedicated to the one true God, Yahweh, would be defiled by those who don't honor God and then deportation, that we'd be driven off the land that God gave to our forefather Abraham on which we were meant to be a light of revelation to the nations, inviting them to know the God who has blessed us. And what you see in verses one and two is you see that worst case scenario take place. All their worst fears come true. And in verse one, it says, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessel in the treasury of his God. Daniel, who we'll get to in a moment, was raised under the last good king of Judah, Josiah. And Josiah died in the battle of Megiddo under the Egyptians. And Judah kind of became a vassal state under Egypt. But there was a new power rising in the east, Babylon. And they came in 605 BC and destroyed Egypt's forces and took over the region. That's why you see in chapter one, there's no battle for Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar just surrounds the city and tells them, I'm the captain now. You got a new ruler in town. And Jehoiakim is deposed, and later he'll be carried off. Jerusalem will be taken over in three great deportations. This will start the first one, right? And yet notice the first little bit of theology in verse 2. Uh, God's people don't lose. It says the Lord gave Jehoiakim into Nebuchadnezzar's hand. Uh, this is not a story of Nebuchadnezzar's military brilliance, or as was po popular in the ancient Near East to think, his gods triumph over their gods. He says, no, our Lord gave us into his hands. And it was an act of judgment. Because God had told his people, Judah, and that name Judah means praise. I am building you as a nation to live for the praise of God. That as you declare my attributes to the world, you will be a light of revelation to the nations. You'll be a kingdom of priests. That's why he put them on the land they're on, so that they could reach out to the nations with the glory of God. And he told them, I will bless you so you'll be a blessing to others. 
But as so often is the case, as soon as they were launched to be a blessing, they became enamored with the nations and learned their ways. And they were allured by the sensuality and the culture, by some broken and sad versions of sexuality and to the pursuit of money and economic success, even to the sacrificing of their children. And God warns them over and over again, all the way back from Moses and Leviticus and Deuteronomy, then through the prophets, if you persist in this disobedience, I will judge you. They did, so he did. And he cast them out all the way to Babylon. That's one of the questions of this book. Will God be faithful even when his people were faithless? God did what he promised. He cast them into exile. And you see that Nebuchadnezzar takes some of the vessels of the very house of God and puts them in the house of his God in the land of Shinar. And that name Shinar is kind of an archaism. It was an old word for the region of Babylon, all the way back in Genesis, in the Tower of Babel. It was meant to brought to mind where you are headed is you now live in a place that lives in opposition to God. And so you now live there, and your faithfulness will be met with opposition. And yet he doesn't just take the vessels of the house of God. It's not just degradation, it's deportation. And look in verses three and following, we meet our main characters. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. When the nation of Assyria wiped out the northern tribes of Israel earlier, the Assyrians were brutal. They raped all the women, they beheaded the men and stacked their heads against the wall, they cut down all the trees and they sowed the land with salt so that nothing would grow again. The Babylonians were a bit more sophisticated. And rather than murdering everybody, they said, no, we'll take over, but some of you are competent people, we want you to serve, we want your best to work in our nation. And so they line up these kids and say, we'll take some of the best of you. And we will take you to be trained to serve the kingdom of Babylon, right? And so here what you see in this moment is rather than demolish the city, which he'll end up doing later, he says, we'll take hostages. And not just hostages, those who can be of potential benefit to our new administration in our rising empire. And so look at his selection criteria. He lines up these boys in verse 4. He says they need to be of the royal family. That is of noble birth. Daniel and the boys will be of the tribe of Judah, the line of kings. They need to be young. They were probably around 14 or 15. Old enough to travel the 900 miles to Babylon, but young enough to be impressionable, right? Without blemish, no physical defects, and of good appearance. They had to be hot. They had to be skillful in all wisdom. That doesn't mean intelligent, but they had capacity to learn and competent to stand in the king's palace. That not just competent, you have poise. You can function in the royal halls. We need the student body presidents from all 50 states to move to the capital city. Just try to imagine this. That's the way it was long ago. We will take your best and we will bring you here. And what does he do with them? What's the goal? He says to teach them the literature, and the language of the Chaldeans. His agenda, re-education. And so I love this. One of my old uh, pastors said it this way. He said he lines them up like an FFA hog show, right? It says, I'll pick the best one, right? Uh, We were in Acadia last week, and uh, my wife wanted to order lobster uh, up in Acadia where lobsters are found, and they told her, hey, go pick out the best, Find the best one and drop it into that cauldron of boiling water, right? And that's what's about to happen. We'll take your best and we will drop you into the boiling waters of Babylon. We will remake you for our purposes. You see it? We will teach you the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. Now, I want you to watch the pressure these boys are put under, okay? We're going to change your location, We're going to move you from your hometown, and we're going to move you hundreds of miles away to the capital city of a foreign power, Babylon. We're going to change your literature. We will teach you the philosophy of Babylon. No more will you read Moses. We will take him from your hands. We will give you rather a Numa Elish. No longer will you read Isaiah. We will give you the epic of Gilgamesh. We'll give you new mythologies, new origin stories, new ways to understand how the world was made and how we're meant to move within it. We will change your vision of the world and your values within it. And we will change your language. No more speaking and reading in Hebrew. 
You will speak Aramaic. You will write in Akkadian. We will get you to within a generation. You can't even read Isaiah. And you will marry in among our people and you will live among us. You will become Babylonian. We'll change your luxuries. We'll change your diet. Look at verse five. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. We'll change the very constitution of your body. Uh, in the Old Testament, the Jewish people had Levitical dietary laws that what we eat is all framed by our honoring of God. They said, we're gonna change your diet and this is not deprivation. We'll give you the best. We are gonna lure you with the best from the very king's table. The sensual delights of Babylon will be yours as you conform and do our image. And you'll be educated for three years. And at the end of the time, you'll stand before the king. We're going to educate you. We're going to enroll you in Babylon you. And literally that word educate means make you great. We will make you great in our eyes as we teach you economics and mathematics, astronomy and astrology. We'll teach you the magic of the Chaldeans. That is that you will understand how to manipulate the spirits to understand the omens as they lead human fates throughout history. We will teach you in the crucible of Babylon. And then we'll give you jobs in the Babylonian government surrounded by new clothing, new attitudes, new values. We will make you in our image. And then we'll change your names and with it, your identity. And you see that in verses six and seven. In the ancient world, your name was who you are. It said something essential about you. And these boys' names were all connected to their allegiance to a holy God. Among them were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah, and the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. No longer Dan El, God is my judge. Now you'll be called Belteshazzar. May Bel protect his life. No more Hananiah, Yahweh is gracious. You will be Shadrach under the command of Aku. No longer Mishael saying, who is like our God? You will be Meshach, who is what Aku is. No longer Abednego or Azariah, Yahweh has helped us. Now you'll be Abednego, the servant of Nebo. We will erase your cute little Southern Sunday school gospel choir life because you're in the capital now and we're gonna make you look like us. Anyone ever felt that? And everyone ever felt that pressure that Paul talks about to the Romans about the world, that they will squeeze you into their mold. Notice it says among these. What, what will most people do in that environment? They do what most people do. Conform for acceptance. It's junior high. Uh, my daughter's just started junior high this week and I was driving with one of them yesterday. And she said, Dad, what was junior high like for you? And I said, well, I remember my brother telling me that, uh, you know, we were in Texas. So he said, so if you don't make the A-team in football, you're nobody. And then I promptly did not make the A-team in football. And I, his prophecy came true. I was nobody. There was the cool kids and I was not among them. And they would go to parties and I would not. I'd go home alone with my thoughts and uh, Super Mario Brothers. And I remember sitting in PE and we would sit in these lines for long periods of time and I watched these boys who had discovered pornography talk about the most vile things as they talked about women. Stuff they were watching, things they were experimenting with. And I remember in that moment of isolation and difficulty in the midst of perversity, I just remember thinking, I hate it here. And as I was telling you this, I was like, actually, I don't want to talk about this. It's kind of triggering to me. Like I did not like junior high. I didn't like the pressure to conform, to fit in. And some of you feel that honestly in, in your job. You show up here and they go, hey, you leave your cute little backwoods morality at home. Some of you feel that way uh, in this town. Some of you feel that way at your university. Some of you feel that way at home. That you go, I feel like a stranger in a strange land. What do you do? How do you respond when the shifting sands of culture come out beneath your feet and you feel disoriented? What does a believer do in Babylon? Conform, fit in, succumb, rebel, fight against, make war online? How is the Christian meant to navigate a culture that has no allegiance to their king? In the time we have left, I want you to see five things that Daniel does. How does the believer navigate Babylon? Because in verse eight, Daniel becomes an actor on the stage. And I want you to see what he does because you're meant to do it too. Verse eight, but Daniel resolved, underline that word resolved, that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. 
Daniel made up his mind, is another way he said it. There's actually a play on words here that Ashpenaz set upon Daniel a new name, but Daniel literally set in his heart, I will not defile myself. Daniel draws a line and says, I will not go further than this. Daniel has a standard by which he will decide what he will or will not do in the culture. Write the word conviction. Daniel is a man of conviction. What do I mean by that? Well, let me answer this. Why the food? Why is that the line? Well, back then, eating was very much tied to who you fellowship with and identify with. That's why so much of the Old Testament, there's dietary laws. that The way we eat is going to be a picture of the honor of God. In the New Testament, we don't necessarily have to follow those. They were a symbol. But in the ancient world, it was very strong. The way you eat signifies who you're in allegiance with. And so most commentators agree. The issue here for Daniel is eating from the king's table. It's not just that there would be something ceremonially unclean about eating Babylonian food. He had to eat in Babylon. It was that if I eat from the king's table, I am showing an allegiance with the king and by proxy his God. And that I'm going to show an association with him that I am dependent on him for my life and I belong to him. And Daniel says, that's where I draw the line. Education, you want me to learn Babylonian culture? You got it. Vocation, you want me to work in the government? Done. Everybody needs government. We got to pay taxes. You got to build roads. We got to do this kind of stuff. I have no problem here. Association, an allegiance with your God and his values. No, I can't do that. I draw the line there because Daniel's a man of conviction, right? Because Daniel knows two things. Daniel knows who God is and he knows who he is. And you saw it earlier in the text when Daniel said, it's the Lord that gave Judah into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. The Hebrew word he uses their Lord is the word Adonai. It means sovereign, it means ruler. That Nebuchadnezzar was called the king of kings and Daniel says, he is a great king, but no, there is a king over kings. There is a Lord who made this world and he made it to function in a certain way that I'm not just made by him, I am made for him. So there is a Lord, I know who he is and I know who I am that he continues to call himself Daniel. God is my judge. And not just judge like he renders judgments about me, but judge means ruler or sovereign. The idea there is you are not just the Lord, you're my Lord, that my allegiance is to you. And so yes, I may work in a secular education environment, I may work in a secular vocational environment, but my association is to you. And if I'm asked to do something that violates you, then I say no. And Daniel has a man of conviction. Do you know this is a risky thing to do? Because it could have been viewed by Nebuchadnezzar as treason, that you refuse to associate with me. And Daniel has no leverage. Who are you? You're nobody. You just died today. But Daniel was willing to die for what he believes, which is an interesting question to ask yourself. Do you know what you're willing to die for? If you don't know what you're willing to die for, then you're not really living for anything. You're just surviving. And if you're uncertain what you're willing to die for, I would invite you, go sit under a tree this afternoon and ask yourself that. What am I willing to die for? What do I think life's about? What do I think is ultimate value? Where do I think we all came from? What do I think a a man is, a woman who is, when life begins, what the value of that life is, how we're meant to treat each other, how am I meant to steward my gifts in the world, what ultimately I'm aiming at, what do I think is happening here, and what am I willing to die for, to give my life for a value? And if you don't know, you've got to fight for that, to figure out where are my values. And don't settle for something vague like love. Be specific. Love for a dog, a squirrel? What are you willing to die for? (laughs) And here Daniel says, I know who my God is and I know who I am. And so that is my commitment level. So I will go to your schools. I will get your education. I will work in your government. I will submit to those things. But if you ask me to violate my king, I'm sorry, no. And Daniel has a line he won't cross. He has conviction and he has the courage of his convictions. Do you? If you don't know where your line is, you won't know if you cross it. If you don't have standards sexually, you'll be surprised with where you may, where you may end up in ways that, that really don't lead to your human flourishing. If you don't have boundaries in your morality, you may make some decisions that you look up and say, I don't know that the way I did this is good for me or honors God. 
I had a friend in college that when he graduated, he was very successful at school and he got a very well-paying job at a consulting firm. And when I saw him a few months later, he wasn't working there anymore. He was working for minimum wage for UPS. Not a bad job, but a big step down salary-wise. And so I asked him, man, what happened? What'd, what'd you do? And he said, well, the first client they gave me, my boss told me, hey, these guys are in town. They want to have a good time. So you take them out to the strip club and you pay those girls some money and you show these boys a good time. And this guy says, no, I, I, have a, I have a worldview of how the world works and a value system baked in it. I believe God made men and women their image. I believe that woman has dignity and value and I don't want to use women that way. I, I can't do that. But he tried to be accommodating. Hey, I, I'll, I'll, can I take him to some other things? Can I show him a good time in different ways? But, but I, I can't do that. And his boss said, hey, you take your small town morality and you stick it in your back pocket and you go to that strip club to entertain these guys. And he said, I'm sorry, I, I can't. And he lost his job. And he threw boxes for UPS with his honor. And that's what you do. You say, no, I have convictions about who God is, what a woman is, how, the dignity of humanity and I'm willing to die for those convictions. Do you have those? You need to understand what they are. And here Daniel knows, there is a Lord who rules over the nations, and I'm his, and he is mine, so I will not violate him. Daniel's a man of conviction. But as a Christian, what do we do with our convictions? You pick a fight? You go to war? What's Daniel gonna do? Try to overthrow Babylon? No, look at the next verse. Therefore he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. Underline that word, asked. Daniel is a man of conviction and courtesy. I resolve, I will not defile myself in this way. So I ask not to. Is it possible to disagree without being disagreeable? Oh, family, if we can get this right, do you understand how powerful you'll be in the culture? That the Christian is meant to pull together conviction and courtesy, grace and truth, that if you put those together, it's a potent convert, con, uh, mixture? I don't know. Combination, there it is. Too many C words today. Potent combination. Uh, David Livingstone, when he went into the heart of Africa to, to map it. He wanted to be an adventurer to map it. He also wanted to be an abolitionist to break up the slave trade and a missionary to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ into the heart of Africa. He was meant to be gone for two years. He was gone for six. So people wondered, whatever happened to Livingstone? And so the New York Herald hired Henry Stanley to go find him. He took a group, big group of porters and they launched into the uncharted interior of Africa looking for him. And they finally heard rumors of a strange white man who lives hundreds of miles inland. And, and finally he showed up in a village with one white guy. It's kind of one of the famous moments that he walked up to him and said, Dr. Livingstone, I presume? Yeah, of course. And uh, Livingstone, he said, let me get you out of here. You're sick. You're not doing well. Let me get you out of here. And Livingstone said, no, I came here to serve. I'm not leaving. He said, and I watched Livingstone work tirelessly to abolish the slave trade. I watched him do it in the name of Jesus. I watched him not be cruel. I watched him not be mean. I watched him be patient and gentle. I watched him suffer for the sake of others. And Stanley wrote, he converted me and he didn't even try to do it. I just saw the mixture of grace and truth in his life, of conviction, I'm not leaving, but courtesy, I'm gonna be kind. And it changed me. This is how the believer is meant to live, to pull those two beautiful things together, that he has respect. Right? Um, one of the first sermons I ever heard about the book of Daniel was, uh, I remember the pastor called it Daniel in the scholar's den. And he said, this is more dangerous than the lion's den. Daniel will be in later. That is, they're trying to affect your worldview. Some of you, you'll go to college and go, how do I understand that this is a whole different value system of what a human being is. And he said, don't rage at your professors. Don't yell. He said, learn the art of Daniel of learning without believing. And then when you speak to your professors, Say, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, please and thank you. You will blow their minds. He says, you want to combine courtesy with conviction, and you want to live in a way that forces people to take your God seriously because of the way you live. That's the idea here. This is what the believer does. Do you see it? Uh, I remember for Donna and I, when my first year in seminary, she worked at a coffee shop, and 
Most of the people working at that coffee shop were not thrilled to hear that her husband was trained to be a preacher. Didn't impress anybody. Most of the people there, if you did word association, Christian, go. It was bigot, judgmental, closed mind. I mean, it was all these like terrible characteristics. But Donna showed up and she would love people. She was kind. She would cover their shifts. She would clean up after them. She would serve people. And people wanted to hear about our God because they saw the kindness of my wife, right? And so she'd set them up. I'd knock them down. That was kind of our rhythm, right? Is uh, <laughs> the combination of courtesy and conviction can change a culture. Daniel won't just survive in this culture. He'll change it. This is what the believer's meant to do. And notice what he does is a risky thing. But in verse nine, God shows up. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord, the king, who assigned your food and your drink, for why should he see that you're in worse condition than the youths of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. It's interesting that Daniel is willing to risk his life, but then the God who moves the nations moves the heart of his boss, right? God can do that. And he gives him compassion for, for Daniel. He doesn't kill him. And yet notice he doesn't tell him yes. He says, if you don't eat this food, if you look worse, it's my head. And that's not a metaphor. Literally, Nebuchadnezzar would cut his head off. He's like, I'm going to die if you look bad. But if you notice, that's not a hard no. It's kind of a soft yes. You just can't look worse. And so Daniel doesn't give up. Daniel doesn't go, well, I tried. I guess I'm defiled. What does he do? Verse 11, he goes to the assistant manager. Then Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. Underline those words, test, observe, and what you see. What's the next thing a believer does in Babylon? Daniel has confidence. Test me. Watch me and see what happens when I obey God. He believes God will show up, that the way I live under God's authority is best. And if you let me live according to my convictions, you watch what happens in my life. This is how the believer's meant to move into work. Watch me, watch how I live. But this is the challenge, Christian. You can't peddle an unapplied truth. Don't talk about faith in Jesus and then live anxious. We have to say, do I embody these values? He says, don't just listen to me, watch my life. I remember I had a friend that she was a, an accountant at a very successful company and she came to Christ. And around that time, they came to her as an accountant and they said, hey, you need to write down these billable hours. And she said, but we didn't work for that company in those hours. And the guy said, I don't care, write them down. And she said, but that's, that's lying and stealing. We're taking their money and we didn't offer those services. And when she said those words to her boss, he was like, okay, let me tell you something. Let me take your little morality. And he began to demean her. Don't tell me. You don't come into our company with your little morality. And she said, I can't, I can't do that. This is dishonest. He began to curse at her, throw things in her office. Ultimately, she had to leave. And all her coworkers said, you're crazy. You're, you're killing your career over your morality. What are you doing? None of them knew that in a few months that whole company would collapse. Some of her bosses would take their own life. And yet she said, no, I'm going to honor the Lord and I'm going to live with honor. I met her at my church and I met her hairdresser because she brought him to Christ and brought him to church. And I asked him, like, how'd you get here? What happened? He was like, well, man, you know, I met a lot of Christians. They were always telling me they're praying for me and doing whatever. And then I'd hear them gossip and all this kind of stuff while I'm doing their hair. And he said, but this lady showed up and she's talking about how Jesus changed her life. And I was like, that's fine. He goes, but this is going to sound weird, Ben. And he said, but I, I watched her scalp change. He said, you know, before Jesus, she's working this high powered job and she had, you know, kind of all these issues with dry scalp, et cetera. But as I watched as she, as she grew in faith, I watched her, her, her scalp heal. And he said, and I saw she really is moving from the symptoms of anxiety to, to having more peace. It, it's reflecting in, in, in the nature of her, of her very body. So when she tells me she knows the Prince of Peace, I can see it in her scalp. And that got him to church, right? Isn't that crazy? So Daniel has conviction. I have to honor the Lord. But compassion, I won't be a jerk about it. I'm going to be civil. And as I do that, I have confidence that God will show up, 
test me, watch me, and judge me by what you see. Daniel's a man of faith. And when Daniel walks by faith, God shows up. Verse 15, at the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance, fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them only vegetables. Now, just briefly, this is not advocating vegetarianism. Some people go like, see, that's why you're meant to only eat a vegan diet. No, this is a miracle, okay, that they're this healthy on that diet. Um, if you look in the nation of Israel, they ate fish. They were required to, 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 to grill, to barbecue lamb at the temple, right? Like all good Christians eat barbecue in Jesus' name. And so, <laughs> kidding, you eat whatever you want. The point is that God shows up and cares for them in a miraculous way. And they're able to keep their job, to work hard at it and keep their honor. God makes a way. And not only does he make a way, look at verse 17. And as for these four youths, God gave. Here God is giving again. Them learning and skill and all literature and wisdom. Veggies can't do that. And Daniel had understanding and all visions and dreams. That's supernatural. And at the end of the time when the king had commanded that they be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king spoke with him. And among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they stood before the king. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them 10 times better, underline that word better, than all the magicians and enchanters that were in his kingdom. They had commitment. I not only have confidence that God will show up, I commit that I will do good in this literature. I will do good in this language. I will do good at this job. I will understand who God is and speak eloquently about him. I will be committed to my craft. So when you see me, I am 10 times times better. Is the Christian meant to be different in the culture? Yes. If you tell people, I have an intimate relationship with Almighty God, but then your life looks no different than those who don't, then how Almighty is your God? They expect you to be different, but not just different odd, different better. <laughs> that we work heartily as if for the Lord, not for men. So be a great employee, be a great student, be a great neighbor, be a great co-worker, excel at what God puts in your hands for his glory and for the good of those around you. This is what Daniel does. So when they assess him, they go, this guy is 10 times better, not just from his class, but from all the magicians and Chaldeans that we got, that this guy knows how the world works and how to move well within it. Uh, when I waited tables in college. I remember uh, one of the trainers was telling all these young people training there. She said, I'll tell you the day you don't want to work. Sunday lunch. She said, the Christians all get out of church and they're rude and they're the worst tippers. And you know what was sad about it? I couldn't say anything to challenge her because she was right. And I remember as I walked out, I was so discouraged. And I didn't announce my faith in that moment, but Maybe I just, she just saw it on my face. This, this girl walked up to me afterwards. And as I was walking to my car, she said, that was pretty discouraging, wasn't it? I said, yeah, it was. And then she went, well, let's prove them wrong. It's like, okay. <laughs> and it was like, you could hear the 80s montage start like, let's go. And just, we began to serve them, to bus other people's tables, which you don't get paid for that, cover people's shifts. We began to help the cooks clean up. There's usually animosity between cooks and waiters. For waiters to help the cooks, surely God is among them. And so they began to see us excel at waiting tables, that we brought together excellence and civility. And you know what crazy things started happening? Some of those waiters and some of those cooks started coming to church because they saw these Christians are not just odd, they are 10 times better. Your convictions, your morality is so different, so backward, so strange, and so better. The way you treat men, the way you treat women, the way you talk to your boss, the way you make decisions, the way you handle your body, the way you handle your money, it's so strange. Why do you seem to excel? I was talking with somebody today, or this week, who works in a university setting, and they're seeing all this data about how deeply committed religious people excel in all manner of categories at college. They're healthier emotionally. They have less anxiety. They excel in friendships. And they're like, why? How does that correlate? How does it make any sense? And you go, yeah, it's strange. What does the intervention of a holy God have to do with a human life? 
Weird. It seems to make things better. But they need to see it, Christian. They need to see you live by faith. We don't peddle an unapplied truth. They watch our commitment. Whatever you put in my hands, I will excel at that revealed thing. And the last one I, I didn't get to is companions. All through this, Daniel's not alone. And there's this great old poem that says, dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone, dare to have a purpose firm, dare to make it known. And I love that poem, except for the second verse, because it's wrong. Because Daniel doesn't stand alone. He's got Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael right there with him. We'll take on this diet with you. In the next chapter, in a moment of great distress, we'll pray with you, Daniel. When we're thrown into the fiery furnace, we link arms and take the hit together. That you see the Christian excels in community. And some of you shame yourself and beat yourself up because you consistently fall to your besetting sins. And let me tell you something, friend. It is a shame. And let me tell you why. Because you were never meant to fight it alone. One of God's greatest gifts to us is us. And Daniel, who will not just survive Babylon, but thrive in it, doesn't do it alone. That you see, he's a man of conviction and a man of courtesy. He's a man of confidence that God will show up and so commitment to be great at his craft. And he's a man with good companions. And all this stuff that Thomas mentioned earlier is for you, that you would go to meetups, that you would go to neighborhood nights. Why are we doing this? It's not to do busy work. It's because in a generation that's known for isolation, loneliness, and anxiety, we want you to leap over those walls and find the strength that God's given us in an us that we run together. And then this passage ends with one of the most beautifully subversive verses. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. Some of you read that and go, so? But the crazy thing is, King Cyrus is not a Babylonian. Nebuchadnezzar will reign, he will die, multiple Babylonian kings will follow him, and then Babylon will fall to the Persians, and it will be led by King Cyrus. Cyrus, who issues the decree for the remnant of Israel that they get to go back home, that Daniel will live throughout the entire exile, Daniel will survive. Babylon will fall, but the believer will stand. All earthly kingdoms one day will end, but there is a king above all kings, and he preserves his people. So Nebuchadnezzar's an actor on the world stage. Daniel's an actor in these strange moments. But do you see the true hero of the story? God gave Judah into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. Then God gave Daniel compassion in the eyes of his boss. Then God gave Daniel the ability to interpret visions and dreams. God keeps Daniel in that place. Why? Because Daniel's not just going to survive Babylon. He's going to change it. And you watch as God provides for this man, he makes a difference in the culture in which he's placed. So Christian, I don't know all your particular circumstances, but I know that Jesus Christ is the King of Kings who reigns over our story. And Daniel before the end will see him, the ancient of days and the son of man reigning together over the nations. Daniel will get to see the Messiah that we know by the name Jesus. And Daniel puts in his hope in him that though earthly kingdoms fall, his kingdom lasts forever. And friend, that's our hope too, that in the darkest day, God is not too far gone, and you're not too far gone. God gives graciously to his people who call out to him in humility and confidence. Do you know it?